Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U Online Instruction. Welcome. We are now discussing with today we'll begin discussing the third element of the biosensors that I promised in the beginning of the course. In the first part, we discuss settling time. How long does it take for the molecules to diffuse to the sensor so that it can be detected? Uh, in the second set of lectures, we discuss three types of sensors, amperometric sensors, potentiometric sensors, and cantilever sensors, and saw how sensitive they are when a biomolecule lands on their surface. Today, we want to talk about a very important concept related to their selectivity, that whether they can differentiate between the target molecule that we really are after versus some parasitic molecule which are floating around, but nonetheless is picked up by the sensor. This is a very important concept. Many companies actually die or leave simply because in their ability to solve the selectivity problem. So let's get started. I'll begin uh, with an introduction and background regarding this issue about selectivity. Then I'll talk about two types of selectivity issue. One has to do with the binding with the wrong molecule so that you incorrectly say something is present, although it's not really there, versus binding in the empty space. I'll explain both those concepts. Now, these are not the only selectivity that one has to worry about, but these are some of the most important ones, non-trivial ones that we often forget about. So when you're thinking about nanobiosensors, these things become very important, as I'll explain. And then I will briefly discuss about the selectivity, theory of selectivity of the binding energy related to this concept of binding of the wrong molecule before I conclude. Now you remember this diagram that I have used from time to time in order to interpret the performance of a nanobiosensor. This had to do with starting from a millimolar ability to detect millimolar all the way to atomolar detection. And we have seen that the older sensors generally stay at millimolar to micromolar range. However, new nanobiosensors essentially can operate at a more, much lower analyte concentration because of their spatial surface property, geometry of diffusion. Now, within a given range, however, there are different sensitivity associated with the potentiometric sensor, amperometric sensor, or cantilever. This is something we have already discussed. So therefore, by now you know that a sensor, if designed properly at nanoscale, can be externally sensitive. But sensitivity is not everything. And it turns out that is not if it, there is even more important consideration associated with selectivity, the topic of today's lecture. So if you think about a sensor, it has many attributes actually. For example, it has to have short response time. You want the response time to be as short as possible. You want to have it high sensitivity. And of course, it should cost less. There is a whole set of issues related to its cost, how reliable it is, how long, how frequently you have to replace it, uh, what degree of training a operator needs to have in order to operate some of these machines. But even if we forget about all those, we just discuss these two elements, response time and sensitivity. The issue about selectivity comes into this three flavors. One is false positive. That let's say somebody you go to go for a test and the technician says or the lab report says that you have a specific disease. Now it may turn out that actually you don't have that. And in that case, it will be a false positive because this disease is not there to begin with. It was an incorrect analysis. And then there are also false negative. And false negative means that you actually have the disease, but the report indicated that you do not have it. 
So these are the issues of selectivity. It doesn't matter how sensitive your sensor is. What it matters is that whether you can differentiate between the, uh, the analyte that you are after versus the analyte which you are not interested in. So this is what we will discuss today. Let's consider a array pixel, XY grid pixel. Let's assume that I have 100 sensor. And on each sensor, on in each XY grid, I have a sensor decorated, let's say, with a particular DNA. Each of the elements, 100 elements, have 100 different addresses. You can think about it as, a, as if it's a zip code. So each one of them has a different zip code. Now let's say there is two molecules or one specific molecule that you are interested in detecting. Or let's say that you have two. Now, once you bring this unknown analyte molecule into the system or put it on top of this sensor, then if it is a highly selective sensor, then the molecule will only bind to the conjugate DNA. It is as if the mailman has been correctly been able to deliver the letter to the correct zip code or the correct address. If this ability of this mailman to deliver and conjugate properly, match these two information properly is 100%, we'll say the selectivity is 100%. That means this sensor will respond only when the target molecule has been properly recognized. And in this system, in this highly selective system, 100% selective system, the mailman never delivers to a wrong address. And therefore, there is no long, wrong response. So there is no capture between a wrong target molecule and the receptor molecule. So we can view this problem as if it is a matrix. That sounds strange, but let's let me explain. Assume that in a state of 100, I have just four sensors. And these four sensors is trying to detect, can detect four molecules, let's say. In your unknown solution, let's say you have two molecules. You have the first molecule present, second molecule absent, third molecule absent, and the fourth molecule present. Now you see, if this sensor is essentially a diagonal, then you will have a response only when the target molecule is present. If the target molecule is absent, then you correspondingly have no response. This is a perfectly selective sensor. In practice, it turns out, real life, in real life, it never happens. Instead, what you have is a matrix, which is correct most of the time, but also makes mistakes that incorrectly binds it. In other words, each element is really, each column is associated with one sensor. Remember, I have four. And so let's say I have the unknown molecule one. It has high probability a binding at the correct correct location, that's fine alpha. But it has also a probability of binding to a wrong molecule with this probability beta. And so the response is alpha plus beta. Even when a molecule is absent, because the sensor is not selective enough, you can have a response. In other words, this is like a mailman which, who uh, delivers the letter with probability alpha to the correct address, but once in a while it also puts it in the wrong address and with the probability beta. And so therefore the probability that you will have a false positive even when the molecule is not present, you will have the indication that there is a molecule present is beta is 0.1. So there is a 10% probability that you will have a false positive diagnosis. On the other hand, a true positive would be 0.7. That's 70% of the time when the report comes back, yeah, indeed, you have that particular molecule present. Of course, you realize that we want to make alpha 1, 100% selectivity, and beta 0. But it turns out that you cannot make it. Even when you are very sophisticated, have lots of equipments, there is a fundamental reason, as I will explain in this lecture and the lecture afterwards, uh, the, ne the next lecture, is that why the physics of beta and why you cannot make beta 
equal to 0. Let's think about the original problem. Let's say you have the four sensors I just indicated uh, in the in the last slide with a four by four matrix, right? That was said to describe the biosensor problem, sensing problem. Now these molecules were diffusing and gradually they will be eventually they will be captured by these sensors. Of course, there is this blue molecules, which are my target molecules. And then there are some parasitic molecules sitting around, right? Parasitic molecules means some other molecules which are not I'm interested in. Let's say this is could be a PSA, poster specific antigen molecule that I really want to test for. But there could be other protein in the blood that is sitting around. So as you know that the probability that a sensor would capture a certain number is given by this net rate equation, this one involves forward association and this one involves reverse dissociation that gives you the net gives you the total increase in the number of molecules you have. That is something we have discussed in the first part of the first part of the course. And you also remember that at long time when everything have settled down, if you have at long time, if your dissociation rate is much weaker than the association rate, that it's like a perfect glue so that everything that comes in gets attached, but it doesn't let it go. In that case, of course, eventually the total number of molecule that will be captured will be equal to N0. And, but the thing is that in this case, N0 is not, this NT is not all blue. Sometimes a fraction of them will be blue if some of the sensors will capture red incorrectly and sometimes and so these are the three scenarios that we have to consider. The correct, let's say the correct molecules are this red ones. So this is the red ones which my correct molecule that I'm really interested in. The blue molecules are my parasitic molecules that I'm not interested in, but I have captured nonetheless. So this will give me false positive. And finally, there may be molecules which are sitting on the empty space between the sensors. The sensors nonetheless is able to detect it because let's say it's a potentiometric sensor. It has a certain amount of charge. The sensor underneath will think as if it has captured a molecule. This would be the third term. So what we want to do is to maximize, maximize the target molecule and minimize the parasitic, the parasitic molecules. So in steady state, these would be the various fraction of molecules that will be present, the target, the parasitic molecules and the molecules which are sort of sitting in the empty space. I'll explain further in the next lecture, the physics of this. But for the time being, let's just focus on the target molecule and the parasitic, parasitically bound molecule. So the alpha, what is alpha? Remember the ability to selectively uh, understand whether the correct molecule has come will essentially be the fraction of molecules, NT, with respect to the total molecule that is producing the signal. And what about this false positive, the beta? Beta are the, all the parasitic molecules which is producing a signal, but with respect to normalized with respect to the total value. In other words, in other words, this alpha and beta, once if you knew the physics of NT, how they get on the surface, N geometry, NT prime, if you know the physics associated with it, then you'll be able to calculate these numbers and be able to say whether the specific technology you have, whether it's selective or not. So we'll be talking about two types of, two types of selectivity. The first is selectivity in energy. You see, let's say I have a particular DNA sequence, capture probe. If a comp complementary one comes in and attaches to it, a to a, T to A, C to G, and everything is complementary, then this is a good signal because it has been delivered to the correct address. On the other hand, these molecules may bind even if some of the pieces are not complementary. That is, an incorrect molecule may still bind. 
and the goal of selectivity is to prevent this type of incorrect binding and to make sure that only correct binding occurs. And the second type of sensors that we'll discuss in the next lecture has to do with the empty spaces. You see this blue and red, the smaller ones, these are the target molecule and the receptor molecules. But even when you are done, as I will show, only 50% of the surface, fundamentally, only 50% of the surface can be covered this way. There are big empty spaces that will be lying all around and parasitic molecules can land on these empty spaces and produce a spurious signal. We'll discuss that in the next class, but on next lecture, in this today's uh, lecture, we'll focus on this incorrect binding. So what we have to understand that what is it that makes the binding so strong and how can we distinguish between a perfect binding and then spurious binding. You remember the story, right? That how the DNA binds. Remember DNA is a polymer and the other polymer essentially moves around and uh, they bind through hydrogen bonding and then you need salt to screen the interaction between negative charges of this set and the negative charges of the other set so that they don't fly apart. The question is how strong are these bonds and if you have an incorrect bond, can we somehow see how weak it is so that we can raise the temperature a little bit to detach all the ones, all the uh, incorrectly bound DNA so that we can only, we are left with only the correctly bound pairs and that way we'll have a significant signal without being contaminated by the noise. So first of all, why the two DNA stay together, right? And the reason is something very simple as you may have understood by, by now is that if you have a pro hydrogen atom by itself neutral, but if you bring them together you see, they have no reason to sort of form a bond, but it does. And the reason is, the reason is, although there is this proton to proton repulsion, electron to electron repulsion, but there is also a proton to electron and proton to electron attraction. And overall, at a correct distance, this attraction is larger than the overall repulsion. That makes an H2 atom stable. Hydrogen on its own is stable. H2 together is somewhat more stable. The same thing happens, the same thing happens for salt molecule. So for example, these are the sequence of two DNA molecules. I'm thinking about through the board, perpendicular to the board. So this is red is sort of the arrow going through the board. This is one DNA and this is the other DNA. These are the two uh, uh, DNA and let's say they are 100 lambda apart. What is lambda? Lambda is the Debye length. When they are 100 lambda apart, they are individually happy. Each is, has a negative ion, negative DNA um, uh, polymer surrounded by a certain amount of salt. So they are individually happy. But as they come closer and closer, they begin to sort of get this salt cloud so meshed together and eventually their salt cloud will essentially form a composite cloud around it. And it turns out that this composition is actually much more stable compared to when they are alone. This is what gives rise to the binding. Now the question is how strong is the binding? That once you have here, how strong is the binding? And by the way, it turns out that when you are on the order of two lambda or so, that is when the binding is the lowest or strongest. So how strong is the binding? It turns out there is a very simple formula for it. Remember DNA has four bases A, T, C and G. All you have to do is to count in a given polymer how many NC, how many NG you have. CG binding is stronger. I'll explain a little bit why. So you have four degrees to pull them apart. Four degree increase in the temperature pulls individual pairs apart and two degrees breaks 80 bonds. And so therefore you can simply have a formula associated with it 
when the molecule or polymer length is small and salt concentration, let's say it's 50 millimolar, typical concentration. So for example, let's see, if I have a molecule ATCG, ATCG, N is 8, so I can use this formula. I count how many C I have, I have 2, so I put 2 here. How many G I have, I have 1 G here and another G here, so I put 2 there. And so I just put it in and it says that these two molecules still stay together until 24 degrees. So 24 degrees has a strength of binding, which is equivalent to 24 degrees of centigrade. Now in general, of course, you don't have to use it at 50 millimolar. You can use at any different salt concentration. There is a corresponding formula for it, especially if the cane length is polymer length is long. You can put it in, for example, this is a particular uh, uh, DNA sequence. I have 3G, couple of Cs. You can uh, work it out and you will see that this particular DNA will melt at 42 degrees. That is, that once you have correct binding, it will take 42 degrees before you sort of can pull them apart. That's good. So this is correct binding. So you can see as soon as you have incorrect binding, then it will be a little less because they will not be bonding associated with some particular sequences. So the energy will be a little less. So let's say with the incorrect binding, the energy is 38 degrees. So if you change the temperature to 40 degrees, then all the bonds that require 42 degrees will stay together. But every one that has a slightly different mismatch, they will pull apart and drift apart. That way, my signal will remain intact, but the noise will be suppressed considerably. Your parasitic binding will be eliminated. And you will do some homework associated with it. That will make the concept clear. And in fact, you can find that if you have mismatch in any given region, any given position, position 1 or position 2, position 3, then it turns out you can find out the difference in the melting temperature. And from this difference, you can differentiate between true signal, which has been correctly bound, versus parasitic signal. If they are too close, however, it will be different to differentiate them. On the other hand, if it is relatively high, the difference is relatively high, you raise the temperature by a couple of degrees, immediately all the incorrectly bound DNA conjugation pair will all be removed. So it turns out that often, as I said in the previous example, the difference between a correctly bound one and if you have some mismatch is not very significant. So actually people had been trying very hard over the years to make these things better. It turns out DNA is not a very good or very perfect molecule as a receptor because DNA is sort of floppy. It has a lot of negative charges, so it doesn't want to bind to another DNA easily. So that makes life difficult. So people have come with new, come up with new structures. For example, LNA and this locked conformation, locked nucleic acid has this special red molecule so that it is very stiff. And so only the correct DNA can come in and bind to it. An incorrect DNA cannot see it geometrically, cannot really bind to it properly. So therefore, this type of LNA gives you significant improvement in being able to bind to the correct DNA. And then there is another one called polynucleic acid. And do you see there's an important difference? The important thing is that there is no phosphoric backbone and therefore this doesn't have a negative charge. Therefore, when the positive charges come in, they, I'm sorry, the other DNA comes in, it can bind much more easily and it can rely on specific conjugation to give you a signal. So people had been working on this type of structures in order to improve selectivity considerably so that incorrect binding is avoided. In fact, it turns out that people have been even, the previous one had to do with backbone redesign. It turns out that there are also redesign associated with the bases themselves. For example, this is the classical TA. So this is the T molecule and this is the A molecule and it is sort of conjugated with two hydrogen and Correspondingly, it's a C to G binding. It has three hydrogen molecule. That was the four degree 
and 2 degree. Do you remember that in order to uh, dissociate the molecules, I needed 4 degrees for in one case and 2 degrees in another case. And this is because of the strength of the binding of the hydrogen molecule. So people would have come up with new designs of the bases that makes the binding more symmetric. And as a result, this 4 and 2, remember 4 comes here because 3 hydrogen bonds, 2 comes from here because you have 2 hydrogen bonding. It turns out by making things symmetric, you can make these structures much more symmetric and much more, uh, you can differentiate between the correct binding and incorrect binding and that way improves selectivity. And once you are done, once this binding is done, then you need to control the surface temperature very precisely so that you can melt away everything that is not properly bound, any parasitic binding that occurred. And you can do it in many ways. One particularly nice way of doing it is to put it on a transistor and use the transistor to heat it. It's like a little heater underneath that so that you can precisely control the temperature of the droplet by pushing a current through it so that if there is any molecule that are incorrectly bound, those can be dissolved. And then, of course, you will be able to put, uh, wash away all the incorrectly bound DNA pairs remaining leaving behind only the correctly bound ones. That way, the selectivity will significantly improve. So let me conclude. I told you about a few things today. Uh, one is that this incorrect binding is a key concern for all sensors, but in particular for potentiometric sensors and cantilever sensors. Why? Because potentiometric sensor is really a camera for the charge. Even if an incorrect molecule came in, remember the charge comes from the backbone. And so therefore, even if it didn't bind completely properly together, let's say it's a 10 molecule long target, it will still carry 10 charges. And so that therefore the potentiometric sensors cannot really differentiate that this has not bound properly, that this is not the correct target molecule. It will think that it has 10 charges and correspondingly give you a false positive. And the same is true for cantilever sensors. These 10 molecules come with has a certain amount of mass, let's say, and it will change the resonant frequency that is not perfectly bound will not be understood by these sensors. Amperometric sensors is different because in that case, the amperometric sensors, this binding will essentially activate the redox reaction. In that case, it will be more selective. But in these cases, this incorrect binding is a key concern for this type of sensors. Now, in the, you might ask that in the natural system, in our DNA then, why doesn't this incorrect binding happen all the time? The reason it doesn't happen all the time is because it is aided by a different protein which allows like a zipper-like configuration which allows only the correct binding to take care. Now we do not have an extra protein to guide this, guide this attachment process. So therefore, these sensors, these nanobiosensors don't have that selectivity built in. And as a result, we have this concern for biosensors, although for our systems in our body, this is highly selective because a protein ensures that no incorrect binding occurs. Incorrect binding is energetically very costly. And the final point I wanted to make is this is a fundamental problem about DNA conjugation. And so the way we can improve it is by designing new DNA, new backbones that doesn't have a charge, let's say like a PNA, so that it doesn't repel it, so that you can work with low salt concentration and have a more stronger binding. Or you can change the base itself, make the binding, instead of having two hydrogen or three hydrogen bonding, you can make things more symmetric. That will give you also additional selectivity. Taken together, this is a very important consideration and one must make sure that alpha, remember the original signal, is close to 100% and beta is as small as possible. Otherwise, the false positive will make this type of nanobiosensor technology completely not viable. Commercially, it will not be viable if it has a large false positive problem. In the next class, we'll talk about a second 
a selectivity problem. But until that time, take care.